This video is an installment of our History of Medicine series, in which we will be discussing the history of modern medicine with experts from around the globe. There will be no discussion questions during this video. However, if you would like to ask a question or leave a comment, please feel free to do so at any time. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy this video. Welcome to the History of Medicine series. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Mitchell Rabkin. Dr. Rabkin is the Distinguished Scholar at the Shapiro Center at the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital here in Boston, where he is also Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Rabkin has had a very distinguished career. In 1966, he became President of the Beth Israel Hospital. In 1996, he oversaw the merger of the Beth Israel Hospital and the New England Deaconess Hospital, which he led for the next two years. Since that time, he's remained very active in the Harvard Medical School community. But we are especially pleased to have him with us today because as we film this today, we have passed the 40th anniversary of his publication on August 12, 1976, in the New England Journal of Medicine on Orders Not to Resuscitate. That article and another article published in the same issue were the first articles to report on policies at hospitals in the United States to provide a framework on orders not to resuscitate a patient. We are very pleased to have Dr. Rabkin with us today. Dr. Rabkin, thank you for being here today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Dr. Rabkin, as I said in the introduction, you've had a very distinguished career, and I know from reading about it that um, in the early 1960s, you were a resident in internal medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital and then chief resident in internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. And I want to take you back to those days, and in particular, to the early 1960s. As you well know, in 1961, there was a report in JAMA of a case series from Johns Hopkins Hospital where they reported roughly a half dozen patients or so who had experienced a respiratory or a cardiopulmonary arrest in the post-operative anesthesia care unit. And they reported in that case series a closed chest massage or uh, external massage or what many people now call CPR. In those days, can you take us back there? What was that like? It was an intervention designed for the perioperative period, but as they noted in the article, anyone, anywhere could perform chest massage. And what we hear now is that there was almost an unrestrained application of closed mas chest massage suddenly on every patient that was dying in the hospital. Did it really happen that way? Can you take us back there and describe those days? I think we might have to go back even a little further <clears throat> when there was open chest cardiac massage and um, that was almost invariably utterly unsuccessful. I had the feeling sometimes that uh, uh, some of the more gung-ho surgical residents welcomed the opportunity perhaps to get a feel of the anatomy of the heart more than uh, the necessity of, uh, or rather the hope of resuscitating the patient. But that was the context in which closed chest massage surfaced. And consequently, here was a great boon if it could be done in the uh, PACU uh, or even in the OR uh, with, as a result of uh, overdose of anesthesia, for example. Um, why not do it anywhere? And the result then was, I think, uh, an excessive use of uh, closed chest massage. But really there were no principles on whom it should be applied to. And was it evident right away to you that, oh my gosh, uh, patient X did get a resuscitation attempt, patient Y didn't, and there seems to be no framework as to why that happened? Or was it more gradual that it came to you that there's something not right about our decision-making framework about who gets a resuscitation attempt if their heart stops and who does not. How did, it, how did it evolve? I think it was neither, as I recall, and of course that's close to half a century ago, so we have to put it in that context. The uh, realization that this was a useful technique, um, I think, uh, did not spread wildly throughout this hospital or any, any other, I imagine. Um, 
uh, nor was the notion of to whom it should be applied. I think it was pretty much uh, at that time an individual decision of uh, one or another resident. But it did not spread widely. It grew over time, and I think rather slowly. Now, um, as you noted, this is, we're talking about events more than 50 years ago, but do you recall as a resident ever discussing with a family, you know, Mr. Jones, if your heart stops, would you like us to try to resuscitate you? Did that conversation occur? I think that was inconceivable, or at least not conceived of mm -hmm. at, at the time. Um, the whole notion of transparency and openness with families was not what it is today. And um, the notion of uh, would you like or would you think it appropriate in the event of death, uh, this just didn't seem to take place. Again, in the medical literature, there are these um, reports of certain patients would get a purple dot on their chart, and that indicated that they apparently were not to get a resuscitation attempt. Was there an explicit discussion on change of shift, or was there any kind of low-level uh, marking on their chart that uh, indicated, no, they're not going to get a resuscitation attempt? Not in the beginning. I think uh, at a change of shift, it was, I think this person is... Uh, well on their way out and they may not last the next eight or 16 hours, nothing further. And then gradually, of course, one by one by one, but over time, very slowly, I think, this business of communicating, well, uh, you know, if this person arrests, maybe we should do it or should not do it. It came about very gradually, I would say. Um, and uh, that was what provoked us, of course, ultimately, to try to set some policy which involved a lot more than just simply do or don't do. And I'm wondering, was, was the um, movement to develop a framework, a decision-making framework around resuscitation, was it, was it born out of um, the changing mores of society about transparency? Or was it born out of your observation that there's just unrestrained resuscitation attempts going on out there on people who are at the end of a long road of cancer and it's just inappropriate and I've got to somehow restrain this inappropriate use? Which one was it, if I had to ask you? Well, I think you're giving my colleagues and me far too much credit. Um, because you're asking the question, again, in the context of today's notion of, of transparency and uh, uh, collaboration with patients, there was a uh, task force that came out of the Harvard School of Public Health talking about certain issues, and resuscitation was one of them. Um, this was uh, participated in by a number of people, um, uh, and uh, the co-authors of the paper of mine, uh, both two, two lawyers, Gerald Gillerman and uh, Nancy Rice, uh, were uh, participating in that with me. And that led to our own discussion because of our realization that there were these varieties of signals that were given, most of them informal, there were no dots on charts at the time, but it was also this slow code or, uh, you know, uh, resuscitate but don't intubate. And uh, it was a real mishmash uh, where uh, the indications were uh, not specified nor uh, f for decision making, nor were they specified uh, once made. Uh, and uh, the information was not necessarily that well shared, nor was it, uh, uh, I think, often uh, shared with the patient. And uh, all of this seemed to us uh, to be inappropriate. Can you tell us about the process by which you formulated a working group or a committee? Who did you feel had to be involved? How big a group was it? Um, and how long did it take you to come up with a framework before we discuss the details of the framework. How long did this process take for you to develop this framework that you eventually published? I think it probably took over the course of maybe 
six or eight months, but it was working with these two attorneys and then an occasional uh, consultation with one or another of the several chiefs of service to make sure that we were doing things that made sense to them. But basically it was the three of us. Um, in, in some respects it was probably a little imperious, but uh, it was a way to get things done fairly efficiently. Mm -hmm. And before you published it, uh, had you rolled it out for a period of time to uh, assess how effective it would be in actual practice? We had not done any assessment uh, previously, no. We felt that it was important to get it out, uh, published, uh, see what responses were, mm. but also uh, a good way to uh, create it uh, uh, as a policy in the hospital that would then thenceforth hopefully be applied. Now, if I could take you through the essential principles of, of your policy that you published in Orders Not to Resuscitate. Um, I think the first question I'm sure many of us are wondering is, how did you de determine who, uh, which patients and their families would, would be approached? Was the intent that with this policy, every patient would be approached about resuscitation decisions? Or was it left to their individual physician to determine that this patient, given their circumstances, may be at risk for having a cardiac arrest in the hospital setting and therefore it will be ad hoc as to how this framework is rolled out? At the time, I think um, we, we did not specify those distinctions. And looking over the policy now, uh, the notion of irreversibly and irreparably ill and expected to die within two weeks seems to me to be a little narrow. Um, <clears throat> nor did we make clear, as we should have, I think, the distinction between cardiac arrest in a patient whom you might expect with an irreversible, irreparable illness yet to survive for a finite period of time versus simply the natural end of a process that was terminal and, and death dealing. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, we, we left it, I think, up to the individual physician at the time, but particularly to the house staff, but there were enough in the way of checks and balances because of the insistence that the decision not be made until and unless all of the caregivers with that patient and an individual physician of some uh, experience utterly unattached to that patient were involved in finally coming to a conclusion that uh, the orders not to resuscitate should be involved. That along with the whole process of information, informed consent. So um, as you've noted, as originally constructed, uh, it tried to, uh, I don't want to use the word narrowly defined, but it talked about within expected death within two weeks or cardiac arrest yes. within two weeks. Yeah. And as you noted, it had uh, an element of checks and balances Clearly. Uh, in it. Clearly. Now, the, I think the next question that arises is, um, and if I can take you back almost 40 years or more, was, you, was it your expectation that um, it would be a shared discussion between the physician and the patient, or that really it would be the physician counseling the patient on uh, the risk and benefits and likely success of a resuscitation attempt in their context. I guess I'm wondering what was the presumption about, and I don't, I don't want to say shared decision making because I realize that's our current right. model. Right. But what was the model? It, it was not counseling. To, it was not with the intent of, I think that you should not be resuscitated. It was not that at all. It was uh, in the event of a sudden and uh, uh, cardiac arrest, um, uh, these are the options. And the options are we could try to resuscitate you um, and uh, we might or might not be successful. If we did, 
given what we've told you about your illness, you might then be able to go on for uh, some days, if not longer. Uh, and in that time, there might be things that you might want to accomplish, people you want more to see uh, or be close with or other kinds of decisions that you might want to make. Um, uh, but that's, of course, not guaranteed. But the decision is yours. And um, do you recall at the time, um, as it initially uh, rolled out, what percentage of, of patients you know, said, Doc, don't, don't ask me questions like that. You decide. Or, or was it, no, people welcomed a, a, a discussion about such an important event in their life? I, I'd be embarrassed to say that I don't think we really totted up any kind of uh, table. Uh, we didn't have doctors or nurses report on when this was offered um, and uh, what the result was. So I, I couldn't, couldn't tell you. Um, I don't even think I could give you uh, any reminiscence of anecdotal uh, experiences. Which likely means that there, there weren't uh, any remarkable uh, at least discussions that came out of that. Uh, there aren't many cases, really, where the situation truly obtains when you think about it. I mean, some, some people uh, are clearly on their, on their way out, um, and uh, you know that that's what's happening. Often it's fairly quick when all of a sudden you realize they're not doing that well and then they kind of subside fairly quickly. So that there, there really aren't that many situations in those days. Nowadays, of course, it seems to me that uh, as you enter the admitting office, somebody <laughs> asks you, Do, would you like to be resuscitated? It's almost as someone has, you know, I'm drawing blood now. The question is, if something happens, would you like to be resuscitated? Which is a complete perversion of uh, the whole notion of what we were talking about. So um, I'm, I'm tempted to go there, but maybe I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, can I ask you the next series of questions? And I want to set the context for the audience um, as to what the New England Journal article uh, and that issue was about. So let me describe that for the audience just for a moment. On August 12, 1976, as I said, Dr. Rabkin was the first author on one of what were really ultimately four articles in one issue, but one of two articles. Uh, the other came from the Massachusetts General Hospital that described their hospital policies on orders not to resuscitate, or what we would now call the DNR order. But what was interesting to me when I first researched this many years ago, and I think you and I first talked, but was that there was an editorial written by Charles Freed, yes. who at the time was at Harvard Law School and later the Solicitor General of the United States during the Reagan administration. And when I saw that, I thought, well, my goodness, the editor at the time, who I believe was Hans Ingelfinger, he must have been anxious yeah. about these, these policies because here he is, he's got this Harvard Law professor saying that they're constitutional. Yes. And um, can I ask you, in, all right, with that as the context, I want to ask you a few questions. As you were developing this policy at the Beth Israel, were, and you described that it flowed from a, a prior commission at the Harvard School of Public Health. But were you aware of talk uh, amongst physician leaders across the country that s many other hospitals were simultaneously working on the same thing? Or did this seem to be potentially controversial and, and therefore it was kept kind of quiet and, and you weren't aware of many other policies being developed? I think I was blissfully unaware blissfully unaware. Yes. Were you somewhat anxious about the reception that this might have at the time? No, I was not. Um, several years before at Beth Israel Hospital, <clears throat> we had published a statement on the rights of patients. And that was the very first statement by a hospital on rights of patients. There had been an earlier statement uh, at uh, a clinic, the Huff Norwood Clinic, I think in Cleveland, uh, but that was for an outpatient department, it was not an outpatient clinic. Mm -hmm. um, and when I saw that, I thought, my goodness, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we should do the same thing for hospital care and particularly inpatient care. And we did. Once again, without worrying whether other 
places were doing it or not. We thought this was the right thing to do and simply went ahead and did it. Um, now, of course, it's in every hospital throughout the country and perhaps many of them around the world. So the same issue was, was here. It makes sense to develop some policies here because of the mushy way that at the moment in our hospital and presumably in others, which I had gotten anecdotally just from chatting with uh, academicians from one place or another, and say it just made sense uh, to put this out. Not that this was necessarily going to be the definitive statement for every hospital in the world, but rather would then trigger uh, uh, the development of policies elsewhere. And of course, the third article of those three, um, as, along with Charles Fried's uh, op-ed, uh, was Cicela Box, where again, she put out uh, uh, her notion of uh, what uh, a statement, a uh, living will, in a sense, should be. Uh, and that was fine, so that it, we were pleased to see that it was already beginning to trigger it seemed to me the beginning to trigger it. At least the buzz was beginning to trigger some uh, thoughts elsewhere. Now, could I ask you, um, when uh, your article appeared, we've discussed uh, the editorial was uh, by uh, uh, Charles Fried at Harvard Law School. Cicela Bach wrote kind of an opinion piece, as it were, right. commentating on, on Pretty this. distinguished company, too. Yes, it was. Um, when did you become aware of the policy that was also published with yours, uh, the other article, the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, policy on orders not to resuscitate? Uh, did you simultaneously just hap happen to independently uh, submit them together, or were they solicited? How did that happen that both well, appeared at the I, same I, time? I don't know whether the general article was solicited or not. It was a surprise to me, as was Cicela Box what I thought was interesting because it meant that there was uh, more than just a lone voice in the wilderness and it seemed to have some, some legs, so to speak. Now, when those two articles uh, from the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston and the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston were published, do you recall any negative feedback or was there uh, commentary in the media or negative feedback within the medical community that this isn't something that we should be discussing or doing? No, not at all, not at all. Did you receive positive feedback? I can't recall. Looking back on it, uh, it's now, you know, DNR is, is such a part of our medical state our medical way of, of, of caring for patients and it's, it's, such in, it's ingrained in our society. Does it surprise you that your work back then led to um, what is now a decision-making framework that many Americans and, and people around the world will be part of it as a decision-making process? Well, I think it would be very egotistical to think that I triggered it all. These are parts of the developments that uh, it, um, almost inevitable, just as transparency uh, has has come about. I mean, I, I recall days when a physician, this is a long, long, long time ago, uh, told a patient who had both metastatic breast cancer and le and leukemia, you know, you, well, you'll get a little worse before you get better. Can you imagine that today? Impossible. Well, the, you know, how did all this openness and transparency and involvement of patients in the care process take place? Gradually, among many people, a realization developed uh, really through, throughout, uh, throughout the field. So uh, I, would, uh, I would not take the viewpoint that we triggered this uh, uh, great uh, insight. I wonder if I could ask you a series of questions now, which um, I will say are, are more philosophical. Um, and so I know you can only represent your own views, but I, I know in reading um, um, about some of the commentary that happened at the time, and even to this day, there are um, some prominent uh, lawyers who, uh, in health ethics and law, who state that, you know, it's, it is not necessary to um, ask a patient for permission to not touch them. It is necessary, as you well know, the foundation, at least in our country, of informed consent is really the permission to touch. Right. 
uh, may I touch you in this way? Right. And when a patient says, yes, uh, you know, I, uh, please right. operate on my arm, they're basically saying, I right. give you permission to touch me. Uh -huh. And there are some prominent legal scholars who to this day say, but the DNR orders, it's all wrong. Not only because it was the first order, you know, really amongst the first orders to instruct others to not do something, because up to that time, every order was, as you well know, it was to do something. And how here comes along an order, don't do something. But beyond that, what they say is, you don't need to solicit a patient's permission to not touch them. What do you think of that? Well, in one way, that point is very well made. And it deals in large part with the end of life. Uh, one of the abuses of DNR is the inappropriate application of uh, uh, cardiac resuscitation. Uh, I remember vividly walking down a corridor uh, one, one afternoon and there was a young nurse standing outside this room, her fists clenched and tears rolling down. So what's the matter? She says, can't they leave him alone? I walked in the room and there's this fellow who's in his 90s with metastatic prostate cancer, bones everywhere riddled, and somebody is on top of him. Every time he squeezed, you could hear another rib crack. Well, this wasn't CPR, this was abuse, you see. So uh, certainly, um, uh, you know, you don't need to have any kind of a legal issue there. The patient is dying and now dead. It would be inappropriate medicine, utterly inappropriate medicine, to go and try to do something there. And I think that was uh, uh, perhaps one of the things that maybe some of the lawyers were concerned about. Um. I, I recall from the history of that time that uh, the view that you just expressed was uh, emerging uh, in the medical literature. I recall there was an or a letter in the British Medical Journal, I think in the late 60s, that drive, uh, described a very similar context, mm -hmm. that we're, we're doing mm -hmm. uh, closed mas chest massage and resuscitation attempts on these people with metastatic bone cancer right. in, in pain and now dying, and here we are trying to you know, right. pull them back. And it only prolongs agony for the patient and prolongs agony for the family and cost as well, which is secondary but nonetheless existing. Um, uh, I hear in the hospital in the present day uh, from my colleagues, and I experience it occasionally, um, where families are demanding a resuscitation attempt in a context where uh, the clinical staff feels that a resuscitation attempt would be mm -hmm. extremely inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And so the question I wanted to ask first was, uh, is, is there a trend or is there any difference between expectations that families espoused in the uh, mid to late 70s about resuscitation attempts to the current era? Um, do you think in the current era there are more families who are demanding a miracle of medicine at the end of life? Um, when the context really can't provide a miracle to a dying patient, uh, more so than it was 40 years ago? I can't give you a quantitative answer, but I think because of uh, the fact that more and more people are aware so much more of medicine and medicine's capabilities, there probably is a little more of that today than there was then. In those days, it was still the doctor's no, doctor knows best kind of era. And so patients and families tended to accept pretty much what the doctor said. Um, today, of course, the, the knowledgeable families not only know that they can be healthily assertive, but uh, that it's often useful to have an advocate along with the sick patient who hears what goes on and asks, the, the, the probing, probing questions, uh, so that I do think that there may be more today. But nonetheless, uh, the, the issue, of course, is whether the physician will deal with uh, that problem. Will, will I be feeling guilty about not acceding to the request of the family? Um, uh, and I think they have to 
gird their loins really and deal with clinical medicine in the sense of this will not be of any use whatsoever uh, and it will only create uh, more or possibly more misery on the part of the patient and perhaps of the family as well. Um, and we've certainly seen that in cases like Quinlan, for example, the dragging on and on and on. And so you don't want to uh, lead into a situation of, of, of that sort. A again, I guess a lot of it depends upon the um, individual doctor and how easy, uh, uh, not easy, but, but how comfortable they may feel with, with saying rationally this is, this is the most sensible thing and the other would not be sensible and could be an abuse. Um, my next question um, relates to maybe um, now the DNR in context 40 years later. Um, as we've discussed, uh, Cicela Bach, uh, um, a um, ethicist here at Harvard, wrote uh, the, the third article, as it were, and, and really kind of took the perspective of uh, what we would now call palliative care, which was, yes. what's all this talk about what we won't do? Let's talk about the things that we will do for every patient at the end of their life. And I know you agree with that. And um, as you know, some of my colleagues say, well, gee, the appropriate place of DNR now is uh, not as a standalone decision-making framework, but subsumed into a, ser a conversation at, for patients at the end of life about things that we will do for them um, and continue to do as long as they're alive and things that we won't do and that has been supplanted in a way by what should be a broader conversation. Um, do you think, do you see it that way or is there still, is there still something uh, just so fundamentally profound about the decision whether or not we will attempt to restart your heart that that still stands as a very discreet conversation and moment? Well, again, we have to make the distinction between the sudden and uh, not totally unexpected, but largely unexpected cessation of vital functions versus simply the, uh, the dying of the light. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so uh, that, I think, still remains. But the real question is not how much longer do I have, Doc? But what kind of a life will I have? What will, what will life be like for as long as I have? And there I think palliative care has been a major, major advance, the concept of palliative care and making one's life as comfortable uh, and as rewarding as possible uh, uh, given the circumstances of a terminal illness. But nonetheless, um, the sudden and unex almost unexpected, uh, but not quite unexpected, cessation of cardiac function still might raise the same question about resuscitation. Dr. Rapkin, um, uh, another question that I wanted to ask you is, um, is this, and we discussed this quite a bit in our current practice in the ICU. Forty years ago, when you were discussing resuscitation, I, I think we all have a sense of the uh, resuscitative techniques that were available at the time, defibrillation, epinephrine, uh, artificial airway, all the same things that we would do today. Um, and yet today, there are a few other uh, therapies uh, that, that some might say is part of a resuscitation attempt. And so, as you know, um, at the Boston Children's Hospital in my ICU, we have a rapid response ECMO, where uh, for certain patients who experience an unexpected cardiac arrest, we will surgically implant cannulas and put them on basically heart-lung bypass ECMO. And that that is part of a resuscitation attempt for some patients. And so as you can imagine, the, dis the uh, kind of discussion that emerges is that if I'm sitting down and talking with a family uh, about whether uh, their child should undergo a resuscitation attempt. The question becomes, um, am I talking solely about the traditional framework, of epinephrine, defibrillation, artificial airway, um, or should I, or must I, also include in that framework now such things as ECMO? Uh, my, my thought about that is, is this, what would be the anticipated result 
with the result using ECMO uh, in a patient uh, be comparable in terms of the outcome to the result where the patient to have had cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac arrest, and been resuscitated. Therefore, it seems to me that it should not be uh, procedure specific. Um, uh, in, in, in a sense, um, if you have a patient, let's say, uh, who is pre-terminal and um, they're choking on a piece of meat, you'd certainly do a Heimlich um, uh, uh, <laughs> because the anticipated result is that they would go on with whatever their course would be. Um, uh, if you had a, 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 a diabetic patient who was terminal or preterminal, and they became hypoglycemic, you'd give them some IV glucose uh, uh, if, they, if they went into coma. Uh, and so, uh, in, in a sense, is it really any different uh, when you think about sudden cardiac arrest or uh, sudden hypoglycemia or sudden choking or the need to ventilate via ECMO? Uh, uh, I, I would think it should not be procedure specific and exclude others. Well, I have to say, I think that's a very uh, wise and lucid framework that, it, that it's not about the procedure, it's about whether that therapy is associated with improved outcomes from that crisis or not. Exactly. Uh, I think that's a wonderful way to put it. In a patient in the context that we've been discussing, yeah. Exactly. Um, Dr. Rapkin, any uh, f further thoughts? Well, my question, of course, is how do all these considerations uh, play out in your shop? Well, um, I, when I think of day-to-day -day practice, I, I, I do think of, of what you did with your publication because it is true on rounds um, that we're often asking ourselves, um, have we reached the moment where we should have a conversation with this family about resuscitation status? And so that remains a daily uh, decision that we weigh about where are we in this framework. Um, uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, uh, it's equally true on rounds when we're walking around to um, making sure that we communicate in the decision-making framework that you outlined 40 years ago, mm -hmm. that we make sure that you know, the so-called third shift understands mm -hmm. what the decisions were uh, in the room in the conference room with the family and, uh, and the relevant uh, clinicians. And so the framework that you set up um, remains an integral part of what I do every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the first thing. Um, I think the second thing is that um, I don't know this is to be true uh, because I don't deal practice adult medicine, but for many parents, um, we understand that there's a reluctance to have a conversation for us. And for many, almost a resentment if I ask to have the conversation because they feel, quote, we're giving up on their, their child. Now, certainly that's true of loved ones, whether you're, no matter what your age may be. But I think that, that the, there is more, perhaps, symbolism to a parent uh, because we're not talking about someone who's lived a full life. Right. But we're, of course, talking about we're at the threshold of now a serious conversation about the fact that your child's not going to see a full life. Right. And so I think that moment, uh, that decision-making framework that you gave us, which is so valuable, has uh, more symbolism for many parents that we have to be cognizant of and respectful of mm -hmm. as we introduce it um, so that we can work with them uh, during these difficult moments. Yeah, it's much more difficult, it would seem to me, your task than uh, dealing with the, the uh, adult patient. Uh, you think about it, you know, if you lose a spouse, you're a widow or a widower. If you lose a parent, you become an orphan. But there are no words for the parent who loses a child. Yes, well said. It's unspeakable. Yes. Yeah, and that sort of creates an intensity that is just beyond, almost beyond words. Yeah. Well said. Well, uh, Dr. Mitchell Rapkin, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, 
uh, I know from hearing from colleagues over many decades that you're, I think, candidly too humble to say this, so I'll say it. But the work that you did 40 years ago and more, uh, and in particular around the DNR framework, uh, you provided for the medical community across the globe in 1976 and to this present day, a framework that uh, we all use and that benefits uh, countless humans across the globe about having a say in what will happen to them at the end of their life. And that's just an absolutely extraordinary gift that you've given uh, to the medical field and to um, people everywhere. So thank you for being with us today and thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts on this. Well, Dr. Burns, thank you very much for inviting me to share this conversation with you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. 